3.4 lesson 2 derivative of the power function and another definition of derivative we have two objectives for today's lesson the first one is you'll be able to use the power rule along with three other differentiation rules to quickly find derivatives of functions so yesterday we learned the following we learned this definition for finding the derivative as a function to find the derivative of a function f written f prime of x we take the limit of this difference quotient as delta x approaches zero we were able to do that for our homework problems last night but you do have to go through the limit finding the limit which can take uh, maybe one or two minutes depending on how fast you're working we want to know if we can use this definition of the derivative as a function to generalize some differentiation rules which would allow us to more quickly find derivatives of functions without having to take a limit every single time we want to find a derivative so what we'd like to do is find the limit once in a general fashion so that we can then have a differentiation rule called the power rule which will allow us to more quickly find derivatives this is the homework from last night and these are the correct answers for the six problems where you had to use the definition of the derivative as a function to find f prime of x for each of the following and for each of these problems from the homework last night you found this limit and after finding the limit you ended up with these answers for the derivative so what we like to do now is we'd like to see if we can use this definition to come up with a formula for finding the derivative for a power function what is a power function a power function has the form x raised to some power n where n is a constant so for example you could have a power function such as f of x is equal to x raised to the third power so how would you find the derivative of a power function you would use this definition of the derivative as a function and then once we apply this definition to the general power function f of x is equal to x to the n we can easily find derivatives of any power function such as x squared or x to the third uh, we would be able to find those derivatives quickly by using our differentiation rule called the power rule so how do we find what the derivative of a general power function should be we want to know what f prime of x should be so to find that derivative you have to use the definition of the derivative as a function that we learned yesterday but once you do it generally for a generic power function you can just use the power rule to find derivatives of other power functions you would not have to use the limit definition again and again because you will just use it one time to find a general differentiation rule called the power rule which is applicable for any power function where n is a constant so here we look at a partial proof uh, the power rule is more general than what we're going to look at here but uh, this is what we call a partial proof it considers the case where n is a positive integer greater than one then how do we find what the derivative of the generic power function should be if you look at the first step in the partial proof of the power rule we're taking this limit from the derivative as a function of x definition that we worked with yesterday 
we take the limit as delta x approaches 0 of this difference quotient. And if you look at the difference quotient, it has three parts to it. There is delta x in the denominator, and then you have whatever your function is, because you have minus f of x, that delta x in the denominator, and then in the numerator you have minus f of x, whatever your function is. In our case, our function is x to the n, so we have minus x to the n in the numerator. And then you have the function evaluated at x plus delta x. Our function is x to the n, where you take the input and you raise it to the nth power. So we're going to take our input, which is x plus delta n, uh, x plus delta x, and raise it to the nth power. So how do you do that? Uh, you actually have to do this. x plus delta x times x plus delta x times x plus delta x times x plus delta x and you would have a total of n factors of x plus delta x that you need to multiply together. That's what x plus delta x to the n power mean. So how would you find that? There is a theorem in mathematics called the binomial theorem and that is used to obtain what we have here. So we ha you may not have learned about that, but there is such a theorem. You can look it up if you'd like to. But when you use the binomial theorem, you're able to expand x plus delta x to the n power and get what we have here. And then, of course, you have minus x to the n divided by delta x. So we obtain what we have here in blue by using something called the binomial theorem. And when you look at uh, what we have there, one thing that you'll notice is that you have x to the n here, and you have minus x to the n. So those two terms will subtract to give you 0. So you're just left with what I'm about to circle in gold right now. In the numerator, this is all we're left with. And you can see that each of those terms in the numerator has a common factor of delta x that I can factor out and cancel with the delta x that's in the denominator. So when we do that, the denominator will be canceled out and a factor of delta x will be factored out from each of these terms in the numerator. So this particular term has only one factor of delta x, so when you factor it out, you're just left with n times x to the n minus 1. The other terms have more than one factor of delta x. So for example, if you look at this term, we have got two factors of delta x. So when you factor one delta x out, you're still left with one factor of delta x. This term here has n factors of delta x. So when you factor out one factor of delta x, you're left with n minus one factors of delta x. And of course, the delta x that you factor out from each of those terms will cancel with the delta x in the denominator. So now to find the limit as delta x approaches 0, you would replace delta x with 0. And all of the terms, except the very first one, has delta x as a factor in them. So all of these other terms, when you substitute 0 for delta x, will become 0. The only term that does not become 0 is this one here, and that would be the derivative of the power function x to the n. It would be f prime of x is equal to n times x to the n minus 1. And this is what we call a partial proof because we're only considering when n is a positive integer greater than 1, but the power rule is more general than that. So here we have the derivative of the power function that we just looked at. If you have a power function f of x is equal to x to the n, then its derivative is n times x to the n minus 1. The exponent must be a constant. It could be a positive integer. It could be a negative integer. It could be a rational number. 
It could be an irrational number. As long as n is some real constant, you can use the power rule to find the derivative of a power function. So what does the power rule tell us? It tells us how to find the derivative of a power function. To differentiate the power function f of x is equal to x to the n, look at what the rule is telling us. Multiply by the original exponent n. You see that here. You have the original exponent is n. So you have n times x to the n minus 1 power. Then reduce the exponent by 1 to get the new exponent. And you see that from the homework last night. So for number 1, you had x squared, and the derivative of x squared was 2x. For number 6, you had x cubed, and the derivative of x cubed was 3x squared. So what should you walk away with from what we just did? We used the definition of the derivative as a function using the limit of this difference quotient, and we used it to find the derivative of a generic power function. So now whenever you have any power function, such as, let's say you have f of x is equal to x to the 11th, and you want to find f prime of x, you don't have to use the definition of the derivative as a function directly you will be using the power rule. So in a sense, you are using this definition of the derivative as a function, but indirectly, because you're using the power rule, which is proved or derived from this definition. And using the power rule, you're going to get 11 times x to the 10th as the derivative of the function. So this is much quicker than having to use the limit definition. We use it to establish the power rule, and then we use the power rule to find derivatives of power functions. We will now take a look at other differentiation rules. And these other differentiation rules, when used in conjunction with the power rule, will allow us to do the problems from last night's homework very quickly. So these are the other differentiation rules, and each one of these are proved using the definition of the derivative as a function that we learned yesterday. And in fact, we will look at the proof of the very first one. And you will be doing the proof of the second one as a homework problem for tonight. So the derivative of a sum of two functions. So if you have a function that is a sum of two other functions, where the other two functions, g and h, are differentiable functions of x, meaning you can find their derivatives. This derivative of a sum of two functions tells us that to find the derivative of the function f, you would simply add the derivatives of g and h. So f prime of x is equal to g prime of x plus h prime of x. The derivative of a sum equals the sum of the derivatives. Uh, the second rule says the derivative of a constant times a function. If you have f of x is equal to k times g of x. For example, let's say you have f of x is equal to x squared. Uh, or let's say we have g of x is equal to x squared. This is a power function, so using the power rule, I can easily find g prime of x it would be 2x. But what if you have a function like f of x is equal to 5 times x squared? So you have a constant times a function x squared. The constant is 5 and the function is x squared. So you can write f of x as 5 times x squared and x squared is the function g of x. So generally, you have f of x is equal to some constant k times g of x, where g is a differentiable function of x. How do you find f prime of x? This rule tells us that 
if you have a function that's a constant times a differentiable function, then the derivative will be the constant times the derivative of the differentiable function. So that allows you to find the derivative of f very easily. My constant here is 5, and the function that's differentiable is a power function, and I can find the derivative of x squared using the power rule, and that would be 2x. So I have f prime of x is equal to 5 times 2x, which is going to be 5 times 2 is 10, so I have 10x. So that's what this second rule allows you to do. The derivative of a constant times a function equals the constant times the derivative of the function. Let's take a look at the third rule here, the derivative of a constant function. If f of x is equal to a constant function, where c stands for a constant, then the derivative is equal to zero for all values of x. And this is something that you already understood from before. If you have, for example, f of x is equal to 5, the graph of this function would be a horizontal line. It would just be a horizontal line at y is equal to 5. And the slopes of tangent lines to this horizontal line are all 0. So f prime of x is always equal to 0. The derivative of a constant function is equal to 0. Let's see how we can use these differentiation rules to help us do number 2 from the homework last night quickly. So here's number 2 from the homework last night. Of course, last night you were asked to use the definition of the derivative as a function to find each of these derivatives. But now we can use these differentiation rules to do the problem more quickly. So you have f of x is equal to 5, which is a constant, times a differentiable function. I know this function is differentiable because it's a power function, so I can find the derivative using the power rule. But I have 5 times a differentiable function, so I can use the derivative of a constant times a function. And then I have plus 7 times x. And I have the sum, so I can use the derivative of a sum of two functions. And here I have x to the first power. Uh, you can actually see what the derivative of the function y is equal to x would be. If you look at the graph of y is equal to x, the line y is equal to x, if you look at it in slope-intercept form, it has a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. So the derivative of y is equal to x would be equal to 1. This is the line y is equal to x, and if you look at any point on this graph, the slope is equal to 1. So the derivative of y is equal to x is 1. So x to the first is y is equal to x, and it is a differentiable function. So you have a constant times a differentiable function, so you can use the derivative of a constant times a differentiable function for the second term as well as for the first term, and then you have a sum of two differentiable functions. So here's how you can quickly find the derivative for number two from last night's homework using the rules that we're learning about today. So we have f prime of x is equal to 5 times the derivative of x squared. You use the power rule for that, which would be 2x. And then you have plus 7 times the derivative of the function y is equal to x, which is just 1. So the derivative of the function f of x would be f prime of x. You have 5 times 2, which is 10, so you have 10x plus 7. And that's what we found for number 2 when we did our homework last night. Here is number 2 from the homework last night, and of course you can 
use the same rules that we learned about to do number three. Uh, there is a constant term, but we know that the derivative of a constant is zero. So for these two terms, it's the same as what we had for number two. So we have the derivative of f with respect to x is 10x plus 7 plus 0. The derivative of the, of the constant term is 0. Same thing for number 4. The derivative of the constant term 9 is 0, so you have plus 0, which you don't need to write, and so on. So these problems from last night's homework can be done quickly now because we have these differentiation rules. Again, I want to emphasize that these differentiation rules that we're learning about today, they all come from the definition of the derivative as a function that we learned about yesterday. And to help you see that, we're going to look at the proof of the first of these differentiation rules, the derivative of a sum of two functions. So if you have f of x is equal to a sum of two differentiable functions g and h, where g and h are differentiable functions, then the theorem that we saw states that the derivative of f is equal to the sum of the derivatives of g and h. Why is this true? How do we show that this is true? How do we show that this is true in general? We have to use the definition of the derivative as a function that we learned about yesterday. So when you look at the proof of any differentiation rule, you will start by using the limit of this difference quotient. And we see that here. By the definition of derivative, if we're trying to find f prime of x, we have to use this definition. So f prime of x by definition would be the limit as delta x approaches 0 of this difference quotient. You have f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. And how would you uh, do each of these parts that I use different colors for? The delta x part is really easy, so you just have that. And of course, don't forget, you need to keep writing the limit as delta x approaches 0. And in the numerator of the difference quotient, you have minus f of x. What is our rule for f of x? f of x is equal to g of x plus h of x. So f of x is g of x plus h of x. So that's why we have minus g of x plus h of x. And for the blue part, we have the function f evaluated at the input x plus delta x. But what is the function f? It is the function g plus the function h. So we have, for the blue part, the function g evaluated at x plus delta x plus the function h evaluated at x plus delta x. So that's the blue part. So now we're going to go ahead and regroup the terms that we have in the numerator here. You can begin by distributing the minus sign. So you have minus g of x and minus h of x. And then you're going to write g of x plus delta x minus g of x plus h of x plus delta x minus h of x. And you have that plus sign. All of that divided by delta x. Now you have here a fraction, and you can write that as a sum of two fractions with a common denominator of delta x. So now what you see is you have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of a sum. You have the limit of a sum, and in chapter 2, we learned how to find the limit of a sum of two functions. It is the sum of the limits. So you find the limit of each function and add the two limits together to find the limit of a sum of two functions. And now take a look at the line that we're on. This is the line that we're on. What is this? It's this limit of the difference quotient from the definition of the derivative as a function. 
and our function is g of x. So what is that limit? Because we know the function g to be differentiable, that limit would be g prime of x. And what is this? It is this limit of the difference quotient from the definition of the derivative. And because we know the function h to be differentiable, the limit, uh, the limit of this difference quotient would be h prime of x. So this establishes that when you have a function that is a sum of two differentiable functions, the derivative of the sum will be the sum of the derivatives of each of your functions. So now, whenever you have a problem like f of x is equal to x cubed plus x to the seventh, you can easily find the sum of these two differentiable functions by using the rule that we just proved along with the power rule because each of our functions are power functions here. So f prime of x is going to be equal to, using the power rule, the derivative of the power function x cubed will be 3x squared plus, using the rule that we just proved now, we can add the derivatives of the two functions to find the derivative of the sum of the two functions. And the derivative of the second function can be found using the power rule, 7x to the sixth. And I was able to do that very quickly. But in doing so, I am relying on results that are proved using the definition of the derivative as a function that we learned yesterday. Let's take a look at number one here. To find the derivative, I will recognize that I have a constant times a power function. So the derivative can be found by doing three times the derivative of the power function. And how do I find the derivative of the power function? I bring the exponent negative 2 to the front, and then I subtract the exponent by 1. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So the derivative here would be 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 times x to the negative 3. If you'd like, you can rewrite that using properties of exponents, or you can leave it like that. So now we take a look at number two. This is an operator symbol. It means take the derivative of whatever you have here. So now you can see that I have a sum of two functions. You can write 14 minus x to the one-half as 14 plus negative x to the one-half. And then the first function is a constant function, so the derivative of the constant function 14 is 0. And then you will have the derivative of negative 1 times x to the 1 half. So that will be the constant negative 1 times the derivative of the power function x to the 1 half, which can be found using the power rule. Bring the exponent to the front, and then you will subtract 1 from the exponent. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. So you get negative 1 half times x to the negative 1 half. When you take a look at number 3 here, when you take a look at number 3 here, you have the function y. It's 2x plus 1 squared. So before you can use the differentiation rules that we've learned about today, you need to begin by multiplying it out like I'm showing you here. So you have 2x plus 1 times 2x plus 1. When you multiply out, 2x times 2x will give you 4x squared. And then you have 2x plus 2x, which is 4x. And then you have 1. And now you can find y prime by using the differentiation rules that we learned about today. So you have 4 times the derivative of x squared, which is 
2x, and then you have 4 times the derivative of x, which is 1, and then the derivative of the constant 1 is 0. So y prime is equal to 8x plus 4. I'd like to point out that in number one, our original function was written f of x, and the derivative is written f prime of x. In number two, we're using what we call an operator symbol. This means take the derivative with respect to x of this function, and here's the derivative. In number three, our function is called y, and the derivative is labeled y prime. So if you have y is equal to f of x, then you can write the derivative as y prime. You could also, if you have f of x is equal to maybe x squared, then you would use f prime of x is equal to 2x. If you have y is equal to x squared, then you would write y prime of x. Uh, uh, you would write y prime is equal to 2x. You say y prime here. Here you say f prime of x. Here you say y prime. You could also write the derivative in this case here as dy dx is equal to 2x. These mean the same thing. All of these are the same. They are all representing the derivative. So you have y prime dy dx. It's a single symbol, not a fraction. It's red dy dx. And you can also use the operator symbol that we saw in number two of the three examples that we looked at. It's an operation done on a function. You read that as d dx of whatever the function is, and it means take the derivative of that function. So you would have take the derivative of x squared, and the derivative of x squared is 2x. Now we'd like to take a look at objective 2. But before we look at objective 2, Let's take a look at vocabulary that we, we used in objective one. We had power function, and for the derivative of a power function, we can find that by using the power rule. And we looked at linear combinations, which are basically addition or subtraction of functions. Differentiation means to, uh, it is the process of finding an equation for the derivative. That's what differentiation means to differentiate. It's a verb. So now we will go ahead and take a look at objective two. You will be able to determine whether a given function is increasing or decreasing at x is equal to c by finding its derivative at x is equal to c. Explain whether f of x is increasing or decreasing at x is equal to c and at what rate. For our example problem, we'll look at something very simple. The function is f of x is equal to x squared, and our c value is c is equal to 2. This is a very easy problem to think about graphically. Uh, explain whether the function is increasing or decreasing at c is equal to 2. So you can see that the graph is rising from left to right at x is equal to 2, so this function is in fact increasing at c is equal to 2, at x is equal to 2. At what rate? You can find the rate at which the function is increasing by finding the derivative of the function and evaluating it at x is equal to 2. So the derivative of the function can be found by using the power rule. It would be 2x and you can evaluate the derivative at x is equal to 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So this function is increasing because the derivative is positive at x is equal to 2. So the function is increasing at a rate of 4 units of y for each unit of increase for x. Generally, when the derivative of a function is positive at an x value, the function is increasing at that x value at the rate given by the value of the derivative. 
if the derivative is negative, the function would be decreasing at that x value. For example, at x is equal to negative 2, the function is decreasing at a rate of negative 4 y units for each x unit. Uh, when the derivative is equal to 0, the function is neither increasing nor decreasing. So in today's lesson, we looked at our two objectives. In the first one, we use the power rule along with other differentiation rules to quickly find derivatives of functions. And in the second one, we were able to determine whether a given function is increasing or decreasing at x is equal to c by finding its derivative at x is equal to c as we just saw with our example.